Hey, everybody. I'm Tyler Suters with the Consumer Technology Association. We are the owners and producers of CES, the most influential tech event on the planet. We are here to help you get CES ready. The upcoming show is January 7th through the 10th, 2020, as always in Las Vegas. And today, we're discussing a relatively new category at CES, the idea of resilience. And look no further than the U.S. hurricane season for evidence of why this is a critical topic for us. So we loosely define resilience as technology that will help the world with disaster preparedness and response. It's innovation to keep us all healthy, safe, warm, powered, fed, and secure. And this is where technology comes in, on the front side to help mitigate, right, address problems before they arise during disaster. And then, of course, the most natural application is recovery. What happens after a storm, an earthquake, a natural disaster has occurred. So one aspect of that is strengthening the resilience of critical infrastructure. That's the proactive approach. Reactively, technology to help bounce back operationally during and immediately after a crisis. And addressing these topics today, two guests from the World Bank, a global organization that is working in some of the most vulnerable parts of the world, both vulnerable monetarily and environmentally, to help use technology and strengthen resilience. With us today from the World Bank, to talk resilience are Emma Phillips Solomon, who is Senior Disaster Risk Management Specialist, and Viviane Dupade, who is Disaster Risk Management Specialist as well. Good to have you both with us. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, Absolutely. thanks, Tyler. Uh, Emma, let's start with you. Just uh, a quick overview, of, if you would, of the World Bank's position in resilience. How and why did this get started? Sure. Thank you. Uh, first off, thanks very much for inviting us to be here. We're very excited to be here. Um, Vivi and I both work in a team called the Global Facility for Disaster Reduction and Recovery. Um, it's housed in the World Bank. And our focus is really around building disaster risk management and helping countries be more prepared for disasters. Mm -hmm. And why this is really critical at the World Bank is because the World Bank really has two main goals. That is to reduce poverty and boost shared pr prosperity in developing countries around the world. And what happens when a disaster hits is often all of the economic development and work and prosperity that's been generated over years can be wiped out and a lot of people can be pushed into poverty. And so our job is to really think about how can we build resilience? How can we make people more prepared for disasters? How can they recover um, resiliently and quickly? So that's essentially why it's an important agenda and some of the work that we do. And then specifically uh, in, the, in the team that we work in at GFDR, I manage an innovation lab. And our job is to think about how can we use the latest developments in science and technology and apply them to some of these big disastrous management challenges mm -hmm. that our clients are facing. So, Vivian, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, resilience is very much an element of, of CES every year in Las Vegas, something we talk about at length and, and technology is involved. Our loose definition of resilience is ensuring that we are safe, warm, clothed, sheltered, fed, healthy. Um, we could go on with all of those adjectives. How does it fit for you? What, how, how, how do you at the World Bank define resilience? Um, I think there's like still many definitions, but one way we looked at it from the like disaster risk management angle mm -hmm. is we look at different type of, uh, of activities to, to build that resilience and make sure people can uh, bounce back from a disaster, but also mitigate the impact of disaster. So mm -hmm. we look at it by uh, first trying to understand the, the risk and, uh, and uh, that people are facing or infrastructure are facing. So that's kind of the very beginning of our, of our approach and process is understanding uh, the context and the and the risk, and then mm -hmm. from there we first try to look at how can we mitigate and reduce the, the risk to population, infrastructures, and the economy, and then from there, if 
once we can reduce some risk, we look at how can we better prepare for some of, of the of the potential disaster and, and, and hazard. And so then we reduce the risk first, then we prepare for the risks we, we cannot reduce. And then after that, even if we have a very large disaster, we cannot take everything into account. So then we, we look at how can we... Uh, uh, bounce back from a disaster, recover, uh, what we call build back better. So when we recover from, from a disaster, how can we do uh, it in a better way to avoid future uh, uh, future impact? So mm -hmm. that's kind of how we look at it in terms of a very concrete practical action, in terms of a bit of a, what sometimes is called a disaster cycle in some way. Well, so Emma, before we talk about the state of play on resilience right now, um, can we go back five, ten 20 years, you picked the time period, um, to the state of play then. And can you give us an idea of just how much technology has changed this sector in the last, let's say, decade or so? Yeah, so I would say that the two changes that we've seen in, in probably the last decade or two decades. One was in the disastrous management field, we were very response focused. So I think that is that is one change that we've seen that we're thinking – we shouldn't just be responding to disasters. We need to be prepared. We need to be doing things before mm. disaster strikes. So having this change in mentality and thinking we need to understand our risk first, and then once we understand our risk, we can take measures to reduce that risk or mitigate that risk. So that's one shift we've seen. And then what's happened with all the technology and advances is that we're able to do this quicker, better, faster. In many ways, what we're seeing now is just more and more data and information out there. So we're getting more open data from satellites. We're getting more tools that we can use that are easily accessible or simple to use, whether it's mobile phones or smartphones, mm -hmm. uh, drones, to collect more and more information. We're able to engage more people in the process. Everyone's walking around with a mobile phone now, and they can understand and participate in this process. And so what you're seeing is this movement where a lot of communities, people can be involved in the process of understanding their risk and they can provide the information. And once we have the information and the risk data, then we can actually make those decisions and say, OK, how are we going to prevent future risk? How are we going to be thinking about where are our hazard zones? Where are our flood zones? Are we going to build in those zones? We're going to try to avoid building our infrastructure, our schools in these flood prone areas. And so I think all of the technology and advances has just really enabled us to have so much more information and data and also engage a wide population in the process. Mm -hmm. So, Viviane, is it an over, oversimplification on my part to say that the two key elements here that technology has, has delivered recently are one part communication and one part data collection and uh, analysis? Is, it, is, is that fair or is that just too basic. <laughs> yeah, no, I think uh, I think that's uh, that's fair. I think the part we're looking a, a lot, yeah, a lot at is that part on uh, how can we have a better understanding of, of this uh, very complex phenomenon because there is many factor interact interacting. There is a natural and geophysical and weather aspect. There is a human aspect. So then, when we start building, we interact with uh, with nature and we change the way the hazard uh, may be. We might increase it. We might reduce it. So mm -hmm. I think understanding all of these aspects together can can be quite quite complicated. And uh, uh, and so having all this new technology allows to. To, to be able to to do that in a, in a quicker way, and then yes, all the uh, telecommunication can allow us then to to engage more people and and in, in, uh, uh, in, in collecting this, this information, but also in terms of disseminating that information mm -hmm. to to people. Um, yeah, so yes, I would say that's uh, that's uh, quite correct. Well, I think you're being generous to me. But <laughs> <sure>. <laughs> um, so, what is the role of innovation now? The uh, I'll, I'll phrase it as I did earlier: the, the current state of play. How quickly is innovation happening, and how quickly or effectively is that impacting um, disaster mitigation right now? Yeah, so I think we're looking at a lot of uh, the innovations that's happening in other sector and in the private sector. Mm -hmm. So we're looking uh, at some of, uh, as uh, Emma mentioned, uh, all the satellite uh, uh, imagery and you know, satellites that are being coming available. All the drones aspect, I think now we can use drones more and more. We've been using, for instance, drones in, in a lot of places uh, in Africa with local drone operators to to, to to collect more information. So we're kind of looking at, at, at some of this existing innovation and, and then 
translating them, adapting them to the context of disaster risk management and resilience, where it's not necessarily the first place where they're getting applied. And so similar idea with uh, with uh, machine learning and AI that we hear a lot about these days, we are also looking at how we can adapt some of these approaches and and uh, use it on different type of data and on different type of issues that are, that there are usually used in the first place. So how can we use, for instance, AI and machine learning to to understand the satellite imagery or drone imagery with regards to vulnerability to hazard or uh, so that we can understand better how this type of houses may be more vulnerable than these others or mm-hmm. after a disaster, can we use all this kind of new computer visions and, and imagery to understand who has been inspected the most, where is the need, where there is a need for help or where there is a need for, for investment and so on. So right. we're doing a bit of work of, uh, of looking at what's out there uh, and uh, and then translating that and adapting that to, to, to that world. And uh, uh, yeah, and so that includes... Uh, imagery, uh, AI and machine learning, some Internet of Things too. Uh, sensors are very important, especially when you think about floods, for instance. A lot of information about weather, about the rivers, and so on is, is required and necessary to, to understand those phenomenon, to be able to forecast them, and, uh, and, and so on. So these are some of the trends we're looking at and, and applying uh, in, in various places, yes. How big or broad is the technology divide or the capability divide between a country that's dealing with disaster that is you know, on the cusp of 5G and has deep connectivity and, and strong communications networks and and the, the, the kind of national or federal satellite imagery that means everything's available versus what I would imagine is a country that would need the most help, that would have the most trouble recovering, that doesn't have these resources. Um, how large is that chasm? Well, I think as you mentioned, we are working in mainly middle-income, low-income countries, mm-hmm. and we face a lot of different challenges that you would face, say, working and living in the United States. Mm-hmm. So we work in environments where um, they might be fragile, they might be have conflict, it might be difficult to be able to actually get on the ground and work there. Mm-hmm. We also work um, in environments where there's not a lot of data, it's not a lot of information. Uh, when you go and you try to figure out um, areas and you look at the maps that are available and they're from the 1970s or the information hasn't been digitized, um, there's proprietary data. So we, we face a lot of challenges, I think, in some of the place that we the places that we work. But at the same time, there's this opportunity of, of leapfrogging, of taking some of these technologies and saying, how can we do this with innovation, how can we use people, communities, uh, university students, local government to all be engaged in the process and use the tools that are available? So as you know, in Africa, most people do actually have mobile phones and can go out and collect information. And so I think our job is really looking at what's out there, all the exciting technology and innovation, and then seeing what we can apply um, on the ground and, and also working together. So one of the key kind of aspects or like fundamental approach that we believe in is this idea of co-development. So mm-hmm. it's not about taking some technology and applying it in a country and then delivering a consultant, delivering the technology and then leaving. It's about working together and co-developing technology that works in, in the context that we work in. That's a, a lovely way to put it, and clearly it's effective too. Um, how do you sow the seeds of technology in what would be a third world country? How does it start? How do you sow? Sow the seeds. How do you grow oh. it? Uh, Emma, you put it so so beautifully that you you, know, you don't just put technology in place, show someone how to use it, and and pull out. You're there for a, for a longer haul, right? This is This is about teaching people to fish, not just fishing for them. Yes, exactly. So a lot of uh, our focus is really on uh, on creating those uh, local co- collaboration between uh, local government, local universities, potentially international experts to, to develop this kind of, uh, of approach. And, uh, uh, and so, for instance, maybe uh, we're doing a lot of, uh, of, uh, of mapping uh, using cell phones and satellite imagery with, uh, with local students uh, across Africa, even across Asia, where we have more than like 500 students who 
have been trained to use their mobile phone and to use their computer to be able to to do, create a detailed detailed map of, of the area, and then slowly they also start teaching other students, and it has a bit of a snowball effect where we have a, a bit of a digital mapping uh, revolution uh, in Africa <laughs> ongoing right now. Where yeah, you're, you're crowdsourcing. <laughs> in some yeah, sense. exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's a mix of crowdsourcing and skill building and and uh, and uh, local ownership too, so that the data is open and belong to the people who are, who are, who are collecting it and is and, and then can be reused in, in many contexts. Mm-hmm. So that's one example. And even it doesn't, it's not limited just to, to mobile phone. We have a more advanced also kind of a, a use cases. For instance, drones, you could think is, is kind of something that's uh, quite advanced, but now we're a lot of people may even build their own drone, even uh, in uh, in Tanzania and Africa. We have example of young entrepreneurs building their own drones and and then starting to provide services to to other uh, uh, government and countries and companies. So I think this kind of making the the knowledge available, the data available, the technology available, and we see a lot of uh, energy and uh, and uh, and uh, a lot of. Um, yeah, energy from the local uh, use and uh, to, to develop new solutions to, to help with resilience. So as far as case studies go, um, and this is a generalization, but but in the West, we get excited, and, and Vivian, you mentioned drone use. Um, we're excited for uh, our latest shopping deliveries to come via drone or that I might be able to get a pizza while it's still piping hot or my latte can come without a single drop spilled when I'm downtown. But then you look to, say, sub-Saharan Africa, and we're talking about delivering blood supplies to remote areas, uh, to the use of drones um, you know, post-earthquake uh, in, in, in Nepal, places like that. Um, Emma, do you have a, a, a favorite case study or, or a favorite example or something that brings the life and the color to, to how technology is enabling resilience on the ground right now somewhere around the globe? Imagine maybe like an 18-way tie. <laughs> There's so many. <laughs> well, I think we've touched on a lot of the work that both of you and I have been doing have be, has been in Africa. So I mm-hmm. think the exciting, the most exciting project that I think we see at the moment is our Open Cities Africa project. Mm-hmm. So we're engaging in 12 cities across Africa. And we're engaging with local communities as well as local governments, so city, city officials. And we're working with them to define what are their big challenges that they face. And often, for the most part, it's, it's urban flooding. So you're living in, in areas that are flooding, but the flooding is also exacerbated by the fact that there's a lot of solid waste issues and drains are blocked. And there's a lot of data and information that you really need to understand on the ground. So you can't just take take aerial imagery and and do flood risk assessments and understand what's happening because of these very specific occurrences that are happening. Um, And I think what's exciting in this project is that we're engaging all of these different stakeholders. So Vivian mentioned we engage the vulnerable communities themselves that are living in these informal settlements, and they are learning how to collect information about, you know, where they live, where the houses are, where the shelters are. And they're able to contribute to this process. And then you're engaging students who are also, um, you know, working at university and they're participating in this and learning skills and sharing this information. And then government is able to participate and use this information to make informed decisions. And so you've got this great ecosystem of all these different players that are working together. And they're all working towards building resilience in, in their communities. And I think that's probably the most exciting thing to see. It's also exciting to see the skills development that Vivian mentioned, so people are learning skills, and then also entrepreneurship. So we're working with a lot of local tech startups that are are seeing all of this and seeing job opportunities and being able to think about the future. So it's, it's, it's an exciting combination of, you know, building awareness of risk, getting everyone involved in the process, building school skills, and then also building potential job opportunities in areas that people probably didn't have a lot of hope, but here they're finding something that they can find hope in. So I think a lot of ears perked up when you said it's entrepreneurial, right? That's very much the technology sector in the U.S. or globally, right? The the startup mentality. Uh, it seems like the World Bank has a bit of a call to action to the tech community, right? Uh, what is that to use another entrepreneurial term, what's the pitch, right? What is your message to, to that community about how they can help? I think, uh, yeah, it builds on a lot of what was just said by by Emma. I think 
is uh, really working with some of these local partners to develop like solutions that are locally grown. So they might not have all the knowledge, but they can learn very, very quickly, but also bring that local context to, to the issue and the technology. So, mm -hmm. so I think really uh, having this kind of a, of a mentoring relationship and, and skill building relationship with some of, of, uh, of this very dynamic and full of energy uh, used in all the places where we are working is one of the of the best thing and uh, that, that can happen, I think, because I think with just a little seeds, a bit of uh, of uh, of, uh, of knowledge and and uh, and with all the energy and passion uh, uh, and also the yeah the the will to get engaged and to solve those issues from, mm -hmm. from the local uh, population and student, I think then you you will have results you wouldn't necessarily expect. So uh, mm -hmm. I think that's part that's also uh, uh, very exciting. Is uh, yeah, really having those collaboration between various experts, but and also local uh, knowledge and local talents. Mm -hmm. So two final questions for you both. Biggest challenge that you see right now in the field of resilience globally? So I think that the biggest challenge that we're facing is actually how to communicate risk, how to communicate very complex scientific information, how to get information into the hands of people that they can understand it, that they can take action. Uh, this is an area that we're still working on. And I think we've we, we've had a few competitions, and I want to talk about a recent competition that we held um, in partnership with oh, Mapbox. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was around uh, visualizing risk. And so we, we held this visualizing risk competition, and the idea was to put out all this data. We've been talking a lot about data collection and how important it is to have the risk information to make mm -hmm. decisions. But then how do you actually take that and put it in a format that people can understand it and say, I know what to do now. And then act upon and it. And then right, act upon right. it. And so with this um, this visualization of risk challenge we did with Mapbox, we put out all of this data and about 260 people from 60 countries in the world applied. And they put together all of these uh interactive storytelling uh, maps and interfaces, right. taking the data and telling stories through maps and data visualization. And that's a very intuitive and easy way to understand. Uh, it's better than delivering reports and numbers. Uh, so what we saw was, for instance, in the Philippines, the, one of the winning teams, they put together a story around where to, put evac where to place evacuation um, centers in a very flood risk area. And the idea was you could walk through and see this is the area that's prone to flooding. These are where the evacuation centers are located. Are they in flood risk zones? Aren't they? Hmm. These are the number of people, the population that would need to access the, the evacuation center if there is a flood. Is there enough capacity? And it's all in this interactive storyboard that you can scroll through. And it's just a very interesting way to communicate and reach, reach a broader audience. So I think you may have already answered my next question, which is the most exciting opportunity that you all see. Um, I guess on the yeah, I think on the opportunities that we're we having more and more uh, data and information available, but then how how do we uh, build the skills uh, to to use that information? As we mentioned, I think throughout is that it's n one thing to get having data and information, but then you also need to be able to to apply it and use it for, for to act upon it, as, as you mentioned. So I think this is where I think now we are getting to a place where we have a lot more information and understanding that we did like maybe t 10 years or 20, 20 years ago on some of this phenomenon. But then how how do we build those, those skills to, to really uh, uh, take that information to, to act and, uh, and have a, a more resilient society? And that goes from the local citizen to the businesses themselves to the governments that goes really across all society on how we can use that information to 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 be a more resilient society yeah. emma philip solomon and vivienne dupade are with the world bank in disaster risk management let's talk more resilience at ces because i feel we're just scratching the surface <laughs> thank you both thank you very much thank you very much all right coming up next time on ces tech talk just think for a moment, how many times have you engaged with technology just today? What have you done? Now, imagine doing any of that, just a single task, without actually seeing your screen. We've created technology that allow people with visual impairments to access anything on a computer, on mobile devices, uh, whether it's your smartphone or tablet. 
And then we've created devices for people who may have challenges in reading any kind of print material. A conversation about accessibility technology from a first-person perspective. That's coming up next time on CES Tech Talk. Now, we want you to be CES ready, so be sure to subscribe to the CES Tech Talk podcast. That way you won't miss any episodes leading up to the big show. Speaking of CES 2020, get these dates in mind, January 7th through the 10th in Las Vegas. The information you need is at ces.tech. As always, nothing about this podcast would be possible without our true stars of the show, executive producer Tina Anthony and our senior studio engineer, John Lindsay. You all are the best in the business. I'm Tyler Suters. Let's talk tech again soon.